Hey guys, welcome back. So following the death of Doctor Strange, in this video we'll be covering the full story of the return of Doctor Strange. So to do this, I pieced together our coverage from 2022 and 2023. So for those of you who really don't like cliffhangers, you're in the right place, cause this story had a lot of them, and perhaps too many if I'm being completely honest with you. And with that said, let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so jumping right in, we start off with a standoff between Clea, the new Sorcerer Supreme, and someone who goes by the name of the Harvest Men, who's telling Clea that she will not resurrect Stephen Strange. And going into this, it's made very clear from the start that is exactly what she wants to do. And really it's not much of a surprise with what we'd seen recently throughout the death of Doctor Strange because really that experience in addition to who Clea is and what Clea is sets the stage for what's to come. Because on top of this with classic Doctor Strange telling the current day Doctor Strange that he's got to keep Clea for as long as he can because it wasn't like she left, they had literally got Mephisto'd. But with her meeting the younger Doctor Strange and seeing him realize why he fell in love with her, for her then to get the current Doctor Strange back to then only lose him seconds later, which for Clea, this felt like she had lost him three times in a row. Because the first time that Doctor Strange died, her memories came rushing back. There for a moment she had Classic Strange, who days later sacrificed himself to where then, last but not least, current Doctor Strange came back, but only for a brief moment as he then made her Sorcerer Supreme just before he had faded away. So like we expected, she wants to bring him back, and we're shown that early to like just get it out the way. But on top of that, we're shown like with Clea, there's this pain that just runs so deep that it kind of makes for its own story within the story. But at this point, after us seeing the standoff between Clea and the Harvestmen, it's here where we jump back to that morning so we can see some of the events that led up to the dramatic introduction. Because for Clea, for starters, her day was started off with a visit from Doctor Doom. And really, it's one of those things like when you see Doctor Doom at the door, and more specifically in this situation with Clea being the new Sorcerer Supreme, when he shows up, you, you know why he's here. But when Doom gets to the Sanctum Sanctorum, Clea invites him in, she offers him some coffee, even though the coffee here is not like what she's used to in the Dark Dimension, but Doom don't care nothing about none of that. And he lets Clea know because Stephen Strange is dead, he's here to claim his title as Sorcerer Supreme, and he's come here personally to get the Cloak of Levitation and the Eye of Agamotto. But Clea tells him real quick that that's a no-go. And it's here where she tells Doom the title of Sorcerer Supreme belonged to her husband, Stephen Strange, and with him gone, it's rightfully hers. And when Doom hears this, he's kind of like, hey, look, lady, it, it don't work like that. And he's not wrong, because in this case, there is a bit of a, quote, secret thing, end quote, that Dr. Stephen Strange has done in order to make Clea the new Sorcerer Supreme, even though she doesn't go into the details of what that secret thing is. But with her saying this to Doctor Doom, it's more so a thing of her not wanting to tell him. But in this moment, she does go on to tell Doctor Doom, in addition to her losing her husband so many times recently, that even though it's not her tradition to take on her husband's last name, with her being of the fall teen, but recently when her husband had passed, she had done exactly that. But really with the way that these words are being exchanged, it's more like Clea telling Doctor Doom, like what, you ain't seen the title of this comic on your way in but of course with doom being addressed in such a manner he gets heated and so does clea because sure she's mad at doom in this moment but there's a lot more bubbling up under the surface that we'll see here but rather than this escalating into like an actual fight clea lets doom know that this isn't a position that she desired or coveted but instead this was steven's design and his last wish to spite doom in service of this world but also so that doom would never become the sorcerer supreme and with hearing this doom more or less is like you know i'm telling the vashanti but then clea kind of hits him with the where your ass at when three mothers came lurking where were you because he at least could have showed up when the three mothers was laying smack down on earth's mightiest heroes because during the death of doctor strange it's not clear but doom might have been one of the sorcerers who helped wong towards the end but even still he could have helped with the three mothers a lot sooner but at that time there was no sign of him so then here when doom threatens to tell the Vashanti what Stephen Strange has done, it doesn't hold much weight because the Vashanti, they're going to take Doom's actions or lack of action into consideration, which is why Klee is not worried because even if Doom tells them this, the Vashanti are still more likely to side with Stephen Strange because of his contributions as a 
Sorcerer Supreme. But then also in this moment, as Doom leaves, Wong makes his way in. And at this point, for Wong, he's been drinking, like the stubble in his beard is growing in, <laughs> which has always been like the illustration for someone who's been drinking. But for Wong, with him returning to the Sanctum here, it's more of a late night than an early morning, with him coming back after trying to drink his sorrows away after the loss of his best friend. And it's here with seeing this where Clea just wants to get him out of the house. So she takes Wong, they leave the sanctum, and she lets Wong know like we both need some coffee. And not so much as what passes for coffee in this dimension, but instead something more like a dark dimension roast, which sounds pretty good if I do say so myself. But also while they're making their way, Clea tells Wong, though she doesn't know how exactly at this point, she does plan to bring Steven back. And with Wong hearing this, like he doesn't try to argue or stop her because he does admit that he's a bit too drunk to do either one effectively and really it's here in this conversation where we begin to see a bit more what's developing with Clea as the story begins because aside from her clearly hurting from losing Stephen Strange back to back to back she's also very blunt about the fact that she's not human never was and with her being of the fall team daughter of Umar the niece of Dormammu she literally has warlord blood pumping in her veins and it's for that reason that she can't help but feel like she wants what is hers Stephen Strange is hers and she's not going to tolerate anyone trying to take what is hers not even death which really at this point seems to be the premise for like the trajectory of where Clea is ready to take this and really because of who Clea is this is way more than a story about a wife who has lost her love once again but instead this is panning out to be more like a warlord on an episode of snapped but this conversation was really just Clea telling Wong how it is who she is how she feels and what she plans to do. But also along this time while they're walking and having this conversation, Wong tells Clea that they're gonna go by a goblin market nearby. And it's here where Wong takes Clea to a location that's a supernatural half world that's been hidden away in New York called the Shrouded Bazaar. And this location is very new because pretty much what this is is a location full of a number of refugees who have made their way here after their worlds were destroyed by the Peregrine Child. And they've come here much like many of the other warlords who had fled back in Death of Doctor Strange. But now that the Peregrine Child is gone and many of their home worlds are destroyed, a lot of these guys just don't have anywhere else to go. And with Clea's first impression of this place, she's very much fascinated, but also she's curious to know who's actually running this place, like who's in control, which is a question that Wong doesn't know because he didn't really even think to ask but one of the shop owners here lets Clea know that everyone here in the Shrouded Bazaar is free. No one person rules over all of them and together they more or less have this understanding to where if someone does try to come in and take over then everyone in the Shrouded Bazaar they'll team up together and more or less push back that invader because they've done this with Mayor Fisk they've experienced this against the hood to where in the case of the hood that name drop may be a bit of foreshadowing. I won't jump the gun just yet on that we'll kind of see as the series continues because if it is then we'll talk about the hood and his ties to Dormammu and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't speculate on too much on that just yet. But nonetheless, the Shrouded Bazaar is just a group of refugees from a number of different worlds who choose not to have one person in charge. And really, that's something that sounds good, but in all practicality, any group of people within a designated space without some form of leadership or some form of structure, like they're just asking to get torn apart. And it's like Clea, she doesn't mention that in this moment, but I'm pretty sure she knows that. But with the way that this guy responds to her question as far as who controls this space, he more or less just lets her know that what they've been doing has been working for them. Them. And not too long after he says that, this dude is just shot in the face. Because the Shrouded Bazaar, as free as this place is, they don't even have so much as any kind of security. And the powers that be that have tested this place before, they know that. So at this point, when a group comes in called the Blasphemy Cartel, who at this point are just letting off shots everywhere. And like whoever named these guys Blasphemy, like they didn't just mean blasphemy like blasphemous, they meant blast for me. And each and every one of these guys understood the assignment. Which in a way you could say it kind of makes their name easy to remember. But for Clea when she sees this guy like just blasted in front of her like mid sentence it triggers something. Because if you look at this from the most fundamental perspective. The people of the Shrouded Bazaar, they're New Yorkers at this point, and these New Yorkers are being attacked by a group of guys using magic and automatic rifles. So for Clea, with her now also being Sorcerer Supreme of Earth, it's her job to protect these people. But then also with her being Clea, 
who is going through some things right now. So where then on top of that, she's also a warlord by blood. And before you know it, it makes for the situation to where these guys quickly discover that they tried the wrong one on this day. Because when they get a reading and they find out that the Sorcerer Supreme is there, one of them's like, no way, Strange is dead. But then when Clea confronts them, letting them know that like, no, Strange is right here. And it's like from here forward where they really wish that Stephen Strange was here. Because had Dr. Stephen Strange been in this predicament, he would have just disarmed these guys, bound them up, you know, a little crimson band here and there. But because these guys thought the Sorcerer Supreme was gone, they thought they were just going to run up in the Shroud of Bazaar and just take it. But instead, these guys weren't as fortunate. They ran into Clea, the current Sorcerer Supreme, and she don't care. And in true Bloodborne Warlord fashion, she destroys these guys. And again, because these guys didn't think that they would run into a Sorcerer Supreme, they brought munitions that were sufficient for witches or manges, but not so much for a Warlord of the Dark Dimension. Sorcerer Supreme of the Dark Dimension at that, who is also of the Fall Team, who are beings who are made from pure magic. And most of these guys get wiped out immediately because they're just in way over their heads. But with the last few of these guys who are remaining, they throw their best at Clea, which in this case is a Solomon grenade, which essentially is a demon in the grenade that they let loose on her. And when Clea sees this, she admits that it's more than what she would have expected from a typical gangster. And she lets these guys know, like, okay, good for you, that's nice, as she melts one of these guys without so much as looking at them. But she also lets these guys know that her people were binding demons to their souls while humans were clicking rocks together in a cave. But as this last guy's requesting to be summoned, like he's trying to get out of there, Clea lets him know that she's gonna allow him to go back. And I mean most of them, at least. Because she wants whoever he's working for to know that this place is under her protection because she is Sorcerer Supreme and she is Warlord born. And it's up to them to determine if they really want to find out what that means. And I mean, it sounds pretty self-explanatory, but I'm sure whoever they're working for is gonna approach this much differently in the near future. But then it's here where we jump forward later to that evening, where Wong is asking Clea to tell him more about her plans to bring Steven back. And it's here where Clea tells Wong that earlier that day, she had cast a spell of passive detection, which would monitor surges of necromantic activity, which for Clea, this is only part of her solution because a number of other heroes have died and come back from the dead. So while she's still trying to figure out how to bring Steven back, this is a spell she has going in the background. So if he does come back by some other means, she'll be one of, if not the first person to know. But aside from this, she also plans to talk to a number of those who have come back from the dead so that maybe they can give her useful information for her to try other methods. But for the time being, this next necromantic passive detection spell, it's the first step that she has in motion. But with her telling this to Wong, she also notices that something's bothering him. And Wong lets her know rather quickly, like the thing that's bothering him is how she murked those mercenaries earlier. But before they can even get into this conversation, the detection spell goes off and immediately Clea takes off because she believes that it has to be her Steven. But as Clea arrives at the source of this necromantic energy, you can tell by her thoughts that her anticipation for the return of Dr. Stephen Strange, it's building up like crazy. Because as she gets there, she's thinking of the four things that Stephen gave her in order to keep this world safe, with those things being the Eye of Agamotto, the Cloak of Levitation, the title of Sorcerer Supreme, and a fourth secret thing that actually made it all possible. And though she doesn't mention what exactly that fourth thing is, she does also refer to it as a bit of a cheat, but also she has no intention of sharing what that thing is with Dr. Doom because she knows he would never understand it. But nonetheless, with Clea believing that this is the moment that her and Dr. Strange will finally be reunited, and it's here where she admits again because of her faulty nature, she's not like the people of this world who understand grieving and processing the loss of someone. But instead, her nature is to conquer and subjugate. And for her, if that means subjugating the fate that has separated her and Dr. Stephen Strange, then that is precisely what she intends to do. Because unless it's the fate that she's made for herself, she refuses to accept it. But when she gets here and this man starts forming from this necromantic energy, it is not Dr. Stephen Strange. But instead, we find that she's met by the Harvestmen like we'd seen in the beginning, which in this moment nearly brings the story around full circle. But then also, when we actually find out the person who had came back from the dead by some other means is actually Eric Masterson, Thunderstrike, which is a twist that I did not see coming. All right, so when we jump back in, we pick right back up with Clea responding to the passive necromantic detection spell, which initially she placed in order to find Doctor Strange, 
in the event that he would find his way back, returning from the dead by some other means. But like we've seen when she got here, she'd instead ran into Thunderstrike, as well as the Harvestman, who's the stranger that we'd seen her run into in the beginning of issue one. With this, of course, being that same moment. And with that being the case, there's a couple things that I want to say about the stranger, but we're going to hold off on that for a little bit. But while this is happening, for a brief moment, we do also see that nearby, Kevin Masterson, the current Thunderstrike and son of Eric Masterson, who we had talked about briefly a while back when we were getting into like Asgard Guardians of the Galaxy, but in the scope of what's happening here, we only see Kevin for a brief moment when the events taking place outside with Clea tear down a wall of his apartment to where then it just jumps back to Clea, giving us the inclination that this is Kevin seeing his father returning from the dead. But as it turns out, with the Harvestman arriving here, he's responding to this situation of Thunderstrike coming back. And with how this is done, we're given a bit of a hint that there's something bigger going on. Because with Clea also being Sorcerer Supreme on Earth, she demands that the Harvestman at least show some respect and give her an explanation to what's happening here. And though initially he doesn't answer her directly, when Clea tells him that she knows Eric Masterson, she's fought with him, he's a good guy and she more or less stands up in his defense. And it's here where the Harvestman tells Clea what Eric Masterson actually is. And it's right there where we get the context clues of what's going on in the bigger picture. Because for starters, the Harvestman tells Clea that this isn't entirely Eric Masterson because his soul has been commandeered by thousands of rogue ghosts who had used Masterson to cross the barrier between life and death, which effectively make the Eric Masterson that we see here just a revenant. And for a moment, we see Clea try to stop the Harvestman by summoning the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, which the Harvestman then just cuts. And so with that happening, I don't want to just brush over that. But as this goes forward and we get to learn more about this guy, it's also like it's being hinted that he's not someone totally new out here. But as far as him being the emissary of death, this is the new thing that Clea is being hit with. Because with Mistress Death having this situation to where people are returning from the dead, getting so crazy and so out of hand to the point of where she's designated a harvestman to manage those who have crossed the barrier between death and life. And this in itself lets us know that there's something much bigger in the background going on with Mistress Death. Death, with her appointing this guy to pretty much be her sorcerer supreme from the other side. But with all this happening, like we'd seen before, Clea demands to get back Stephen Strange. But this stranger, the Harvestman, he tells her that that is impossible. But through the course of this, this Thunderstrike Revenant, he's not just waiting for this whole conversation to just pass before he jumps back in and fights. But during this time, he calls for his mace, and as soon as he catches it, he yells Thunderstrike, which right away from there, it makes the task of putting this guy back in the ground a little bit harder. But when this happens and both Clea and the Harvestmen use different summons to combat this Thunderstrike Revenant, and the Harvestmen uses Bromagdon's Ruby Rain, and with the way he does this, I can't help but see it as his version of the Eye of Agamotto with him using what appears to be the Starstone, but also with the whole idea of this guy being Mistress Death's Sorcerer Supreme, but with us seeing him break out the Starstone here, which is something we'd usually see used by Xander the Merciless, who is a magician that was crafted by the creators for the purpose of defeating Doctor Strange. And in the past, we've seen Strange eventually defeat Xander and take the Starstone, to where then recently in the issues of Black Cat, Xander got the Starstone back. And for anyone who's curious about what exactly the Star Stone does, when Bromagdon's Ruby Rain is summoned, we'd seen an example in Doctor Strange issue 19, where he was zapped by this thing and sent back in time to Philadelphia in 1775, only to then get there and find Clea kissing Benjamin Franklin, which needless to say was hard for him to watch. But with the seeing the return of the Star Stone here, and the way that it's chained around the Harvestman's neck, and right away it's one of those things that kind of make you think, could the Harvestman be one of the few people who we've seen with the Star Starstone, who has been forced into a position to pay a debt for Mistress Death by managing her rogue zombies, if you will. Which again gives us that inclination to believe that this Harvestman guy is not someone who's completely new. But at this point, with their efforts to stop Thunderstrike not really working, this Thunderstrike Revenant breaks his way out of that barrage attack to only then take his maze straight to the back of the Harvestman, which now makes it the second back we've seen get blown out in the past couple weeks. <laughs> like, what's really going on? But in a way, this makes me think of this return of Eric Masterson as if it's connected to the larger cycle like we've seen in God of Hammers, which is why we're seeing this Revenant of Eric Masters specifically. But as far as what we know at the moment, this is only connected to Mistress death. 
but with his Thunderstrike Revenant taking down the Harvestmen for the time being. He then takes his mace and he swings at Clea. And I love the way she handles this because again, it's a lot like Stephen Strange, but a little bit more cranked up. Cause she just opens one of her interdimensional portals, she lets the mace swing through, and she just closes it, cutting his arms off. To where then the Harvestman then jumps up and he finishes his job, sending this Eric Masterson Revenant, along with the thousands of souls that commandeered Masterson, back to the land of the dead. Which again, really feels like this bigger problem that's brewing up in the background. This problem that Mistress Death is dealing with. That this is something to where at this point we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. But I can't help but think with us seeing Thunderstrike return from the dead, just outside of his son's apartment. Which right there ties two Thunderstrikes to all this. But with all this happening in this Mistress Death issue, bringing about all these zombies, and one of the first zombies we see happens to be Thunderstrike, and this just causes a ton of things in my mind to point all of this back to Thor issue 6, where we saw Thor's vision of his death, which also let us know that a zombie event is coming around the corner. And I wouldn't be surprised if this issue that Mistress Death is having turns out to be connected to how that comes about. And again, around the corner could be months from now, it could be years from now. We really don't know how long exactly it'll be before we see that actually play out or how that plays out for that matter. But I can easily see this connecting to that in some way. But from here, we then lead from the conversation between Clea and the Harvestmen and we jump forward some time to Clea and Wong at the Sanctum Sanctorum to where at this point, Clea is filled in Wong about her meeting the Harvestmen and the two of them have pieced together that this is a sign that Mistress Death has some issues going on. But Clea, she more or less sees this as an opportunity for her to continue to try to get back Dr. Stephen Strange without really running into problems with Mistress Death because she's preoccupied. And for Wong, with him hearing about the Harvestmen, he sees this as Mistress Death creating a counterpart to the Sorcerer Supreme, or in opposite numbers he would say. And Wong is also curious about this whole deal with the Harvestmen happening at this time in particular. But in this moment, they don't go too far into the speculation as far as what exactly is going on with Mistress Death and how this came about, because Wong is more concerned with Clea attending to the duties of Sorcerer Supreme, with there being a number of things that she needs to attend to with her taking the place of Doctor Stephen Strange, with her still needing to meet up with the Avengers, and there also being the issue of the different warlords who still haven't left Earth since the death of Doctor Strange event, as well as her making her way to check on Strange Academy. But then it's here where they get a knock on the door, and when Clea goes to answer it, she finds that it's one of the refugees from the Shrouded Bazaar, and he lets her know that after she had left, the Blasphemy Cartel had came back, but this time with way more firepower and way more sorcery. And for Clea with her seeing this, she immediately thinks like a warlord, because the last time that she was here at the Shrouded Bazaar, when she encountered the Blasphemy Cartel, she gave them hell. Which from her understanding, that's how it's done, because as a warlord, when your territory is threatened, you show strength and you make an example out of your invaders. And with her being of the dark dimension, of the fault line, she sees this second attack as a failure on her part, because with these same invaders, Vader's coming back, to her it seems like that previous message, it was a bit too light, a bit too merciful, too kind. Because with them coming right back, she believes that the Blasphemy Cartel, or whoever sent them, just isn't taking her serious. And when Wong tells her, more or less that this doesn't necessarily work that way, this is Earth, more specifically this is Manhattan, and Manhattan doesn't have a warlord. And it's right then when Wong says that, Clea, she feels some type of way, and she tells Wong, that it does now. And she lets them know because she failed to let these gangsters know who exactly they're dealing with. As warlord born, she is going to war. And with doing so, she's going to make a much clearer statement this time around, rather than the mere slap on the wrist that she did last time. But before we wrap this one up, I want to know some of your thoughts down in the comments as far as who you think the Harvestman might be. Because with the more that we learn about this Harvestman guy, he also reminds me of the words of Dr. Stephen Strange at the conclusion of the death of Dr. Strange. When Stephen had mentioned that a price was not paid, which in a way makes it seem that death has assigned him as her Sorcerer Supreme to manage her barriers, much like we had seen Stephen explain the barriers that he had to protect to the students at Strange Academy. And once again, this could be something, could be nothing, I could be way off, but I just wanted to share that thought. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Alright, so when we jump back in, this picks up from after Clea was paid a visit by one of the residents from the Shrouded Bazaar, who had came to the Sanctum to let Clea know that the Blasphemy Cartel had came back, 
And like I mentioned before, with this happening, there's a few things that this does to Clea. Because initially she's hurt. Because with the Strata Bazaar being a location with a number of refugees from other dimensions who have made their way here, Clea believes that these people are her responsibility. Which is why she defended them initially. But now for her to only come back and find that the Blasphemy Cartel had returned, killing a ton of people at the Strata Bazaar, like we'd seen, this had caused Clea to believe that she needs to send the Blasphemy Cartel a message. And this time around, she's taking the gloves off. But in order for her to do this, she needs to find where they are. And this is what brings her to Richard Fisk, the Rose. And with how this is done, it's like Clea's made her way to the Rose because he's a gangster and he does a lot of shady things, so it's likely he would know about other gangsters and other shady operations in New York. But also we know from the first issue that the Kingpin had tried to overthrow the Shrouded Bazaar, but it didn't work because their magic was just too tricky for him. So it's possible that Clea may have made that connection there and that's why she started with the Rose, with him being the son of Wilson Fisk and the half-brother of Butch Ferris. But at this point, all we really know is that she went to him first because he's a gangster. But with Clea initially approaching the Rose, as soon as he realizes who she is and how she got past security and just walked into his office, he then asked her the question, are my men dead? And she tells him no, cause she turned them all into snakes, of which she just casually holding this whole time. But with her doing this as a show of strength, she tells the Rose that she knows that he knows something about the Blasphemy Cartel. And for that reason, it would be wise for him to share that information. But of course, with the Rose being who he is, he asks Clea, what does he get in return for sharing this sensitive information? And Clea just tells him right there, you get to live, my guy. And she gives the Rose the ultimatum to where if he doesn't want to cooperate, he can just end up like the rest of his men or Clea could just kill him. Because Clea, she understands how gangsters operate. Because for them, if she can't be touched, then it's likely that the Rose would just find somebody else that she cares about and threaten their life. And for Clea, Stephen Strange was the only person she cared about. And now he's gone. <laughs> but I do want to say, like, it's kind of funny that she feels zero threats to anything happening to Wong. And not to say that she wouldn't care at all, but in this moment, I just can't help take that from the conversation. But with Clea giving the Rose this ultimatum, he's more or less like, okay, I could either snitch, get turned into a snake, or get killed. And for a brief moment, we see him think it over, but just right after that, we see that Clea has found exactly where the Blasphemy Cartel is, or at least the group of them that were currently in transit. And the way she just drops in on these guys, yanking them out of the vehicle, swooping from above in a very I am vengeance type of fashion. But with her coming after this group, who again, with the Blasphemy Cartel, they're equipped with plenty tactical and magical solutions. So with this group being attacked by Clea, they quickly open a portal jumping from their current location, which then takes them to a Blasphemy Cartel facility number 24. And with these guys getting here, they're like, woo, that was a close one. But then Clea, she just lands on top of the truck. But also with seeing this, it feels like a bit of a callback to Strange Tales issue 156, where we had seen Clea's mother, Umar, track down the Ancient One, with her showing at the time that she could follow someone, even if they teleported away to another location. And it's here at this point where we see Clea do the same thing as she lands on top of this truck and tells these guys that they gotta be a little bit more clever than that if they wanna actually get away. But one of these guys lets Clea know that actually they had brought her exactly where they wanted her to be. As she turns around and she sees outside of their facility that there are a ton of these guys locked and loaded as if they were expecting her arrival. But with Clea seeing this, she more or less tells them like, okay, you guys clearly forgot that the last time we met, your guns did little to nothing. And right then one of these guys is like, nope, we didn't forget, under ruse. And it's right here where these guys break out with the sands of Nasanti which some of you might be familiar with if you've been keeping up with our current talks on Doctor Strange. But in this case, as we can see, they've used some very questionable methods in order to weaponize its power. Because traditionally, the Sands of the Santi are enchanted with a spell that'll prevent anyone from using magic within a short range for a few minutes three minutes to be exact. And with them effectively using this on Clea, they then let off rounds on her with AR-15s that shoot 700 rounds per minute and doing so with the intention of taking what's left of her to deliver to their science team, who prior to this point have requested a fault teen sample, which kind of gives us the idea that these guys really knew that she was coming. And if that's the case, I wonder who told. But when the smoke clears, Clea lets these guys know, like, yes, she is of the fault team. And it is precisely for that reason why the Sands of Nasanti cannot fully depower her. And she lets them know that in this moment, the Sands of Nasanti, they did absorb all the magic in this area, just like they were designed to do. But those Sands rely on the spell of the Earth Dimension. And it was a spell that was created by an Earth Magician. And in this moment, had Clea only been the Sorcerer Supreme of this dimension, then she would have effectively had nothing left. 
but because she's also Sorcerer Supreme of the Dark Dimension, she's able to call on that power instead through the course of this three minute window. And with seeing this, I gotta say, I thought the Sands of Nisanti negated all magic. And with Clea being a descendant of beings who were made out of pure magic, for a moment I thought she was gonna disappear for like three minutes, I don't know. But as it turns out, we got new information on the Sands of Nisanti. But with this being the case, she then draws power from the Dark Dimension, conjuring the stone prison of Umar which for Clea is pretty much her just summoning her mother's power and imprisoning all these guys into stone. But from here, she makes her way into the building, into the Blasphemy Cartel's facility, which is codenamed Oathbroken, in order to get an idea of what they've been up to. But when she goes inside, all she sees is a ton of computers on racks, to where from here, she then returns to the Sanctum and tells Wong, but neither of them know what to make of it at this point. But also when Clea gets back, she gives Wong one of their wards, because he had mentioned before that they seemed familiar to him. And when Wong sees this, he remembers a portion of a memory, but it's almost like a part of that memory is missing, to where he can't fully recall where he remembers this from. But while the two of them are here, they are sent a message which is mainly coming from Umar, who like we had seen during the death of Doctor Strange, she had established herself in Antarctica. But really more or less in this moment, she sent Clea a message, letting Clea know that Umar is coming to dinner. And not in the nice way to where you just ask someone, but rather Umar sending the message like, this is happening. But then just after this, we then head over to the Blasphemy Cartel's headquarters, codenamed Emerald City. And it's here where we find that they've just gotten the news that they've lost the old broken site. And with them receiving this news, they then get the instruction from director Nun, who gives the Blasphemy Cartel the order to go after Clea, the Sorcerer Supreme, with a demonstration of overwhelming force, where she lives and where it hurts. And with Director Nunn given this order, he also authorizes for them to send one of their Lazarus agents to get this done. And from what we're told, the Lazarus agent that he's speaking of is going to be Randall Spector, the younger brother of Mark Spector, which means we're getting the return of Shadow Knight. But with Director Nunn given this order, he tells the Blasphemy Cartel to make sure that there's nothing left but a smoking crater on Bleecker Street. But even with them saying this, I really feel like the Blasphemy Cartel is in for their worst defeat thus far. Because like we had seen, Clea is expecting company. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if the Blasphemy Cartel runs up on the Sanctum Sanctorum and both Clea and Umar are there, and especially with Umar, who's been said on a number of occasions to be more powerful than her brother Dormammu, but if this lines up the way that it's looking like it's about to line up, then I can't wait to see Umar either turn these dudes into jelly project their worst fears or who knows what this time around. Because Clea has even stated before that Umar's full power is beyond her comprehension. But we'll see how this goes because you know characters often tend to get nerfed these days. But nonetheless, either way, it's going to end bad for the Blasphemy Cartel, I'm sure. Alright, so in our recent talks on Strange, we've been following Clea with her becoming the Sorcerer Supreme after the death of Dr. Stephen Strange, and in the forefront of her motivations, she's been pursuing a solution on how to get him back, to where at this time, what seems to be the most comparable solution was a spell that she created that would track down the recently resurrected heroes, which is an idea that she came upon not only when Thunderstrike came back, but also when she was confronted by the Harvestmen who had informed her on why Thunderstrike came back, which in itself wasn't a tried and true return up Thunderstrike, but rather the results of a more recent issue that Mistress Death had been dealing with where the endless dead are being called back to the land of the living, to where hundreds or even thousands of these souls will band together and form a gestalt entity united behind the assumed identity and cross over into the land of the living. But along with Clea being the new source of Supreme of Earth, she's made new enemies, which also has brought her into conflict with the Blasphemy Cartel, who's been attacking magical refugees in an attempt to invade the Shroud of Bazaar, which technically is a pocket dimension in New York, but with it being in New York and on Earth, these people fall under the guidelines of her protection as Sorcerer Supreme. But regardless of how harsh Clea sends her message to the Blasphemy Cartel, these guys just keep coming back, which now has given her motivation to investigate them to figure out what it is exactly that they're after. But at this point when we jump back in, Clea's got other urgencies that have taken her attention, which at this point in time is her mother Umar, who has invited herself to the Sanctum Sanctorum to have dinner with her daughter. And we knew leading up to this point that Clea dreaded this dinner reservation that her mother had made for herself, not because Clea's in the presence of another warlord. She grew up in Dormammu's court, so that's nothing to her. But instead, it's really more so Clea dealing with her mother, which Clea would rather not do if she had the option. Because aside from Umar being very powerful and very imposing, she's also Clea's mother. So when Umar says what she wants to say, 
how she wants to say it. It hits a little different and we get that from Umar as soon as she walks in when she tells Clea that she expected something a bit more grandiose as far as the presentation of the Sanctum Sanctorum rather than coming here and finding it to be Clea's dead husband's musty old home. And it's like, man, she just talking foul. And with her also saying this in front of Wong, he has some choice words that he wants to say in return, but Clea just tells Wong to take Bats for a walk before things really get heated. But from here as Umar and Clea sit down for dinner, we also find that the Blasphemy Cartel has made their way to the Sanctum Sanctorum, as directed by Agent Nunn. But of course, like we'd seen, these guys believe that they're only dealing with Clea. But even with that being the case, they made their way here with every intention of hitting her even harder than they had before. But at the dinner table within this conversation between Umar and Clea, it's here where we really find the reason why Umar called for this dinner. And really, for the most part, it's because Umar has a misunderstanding of the reason why Clea had become Sorcerer Supreme. And that's mainly because she believes that this is something that Clea had orchestrated and planned for, to take the title of Sorcerer Supreme from Doctor Strange as some sort of play of power to put Clea in the perfect position to just take over the world. And that's really why Umar called for this dinner, with her telling Clea how proud of her she is and how she just knows from here, Clea's gonna need her advice and her counsel. But while they're having this discussion just outside, we find that the Blasphemy Cartel, they are back at it again with their enchanted weaponry to where this time they got a genie and a missile. And with seeing this, it just had me thinking like who in their weapons development department just walked in one day and was like, you know what? We need to put a genie in a missile just in case we run into a moment where we just wish a wizard would <laughs> like could you imagine like for me when i see stuff like this i can't help but think of somebody somewhere going through the time to actually make this a thing where you would launch a missile and will smith comes out but really with how this is done it's like a one-off it's a one hit this dude just literally rubbed the rocket and let one off but this is done so that this genie or this gin could break through and catch clea off guard so that the Blasphemy Cartel could unleash their real weapon now that they have a clear pathway to make their attack. And it's here we find that they send in none other than Shadow Knight. But again, in a similar way to what we had seen with Thunderstrike, this isn't really and truly the return of Randall Specter. Not completely. Because though this is his actual dead body, taken over by either hundreds or thousands of other ghosts bond together to where in their case thousands of ghosts is already madness as it is. And then when you add that to a shell of Randall Specter who was already mad and then you just get madness on top of madness. But on top of this, this legion of ghosts, they also amplify the existing power that Randall already had which then make his crest more powerful and capable of piercing Umar and Clea's defenses. But for Clea, it's very early on while her and Umar are battling this Shadow Knight Revenant, where she realizes that though on the surface, he's comprised of a similar setup to what she had seen with Thunderstrike, but in this case with Shadow Knight, he's stronger, he's faster, and he's way more vicious of an opponent. And it's mainly because in either case, there's still a fragment of that person still in there. To where for Thunderstrike, that fragment of Eric Masterson, Though he had been driven mad, he was still a hero at his core, which in that case made it like she was battling someone who was trying to hold back to some extent. But in this case with Shadow Knight, he was already a psychopathic murderer. So in that case, when you throw more madness on top of it, along with a power buff, then you find yourself fighting someone who is way more dangerous. And for that reason, Clea realizes quickly that she's got to step it up. But also at this point, with it being very clear that this guy was sent by the Blasphemy Cartel, Clea then sends her mother outside to handle them while she stays here and takes care of Shadow Knight. And right away, we see Clea go about this by unleashing the demon that the Blasphemy Cartel had used on her back in Strange Issue 1, which at the time was really them giving a fall teen more ammunition to use at a later time. And I like that Jed McKay has her bring it out now, rather than having it be an idea that just showed up at one point only for us to find that it didn't matter later on. And I always appreciate when we're given those cues in the story. But with Clea doing this, she knows that the demon's not gonna last long. Almost like when you use up your summon in Final Fantasy 7. So when doing this, Clea realizes that she's gotta come up with a more permanent solution and she's gotta do it quick. And it's here we find that she comes up with a solution to exercise these ghosts from the physical body of Shadow Knight. And in the meantime, while she's doing this, her mother Umar is just outside wasting these nobodies from the Blasphemy Cartel. But at this time for Clea, she expresses that coming up with a new spell on the spot is no easy task. And this is why when people think of great sorcerers and great magicians, that they're usually these old guys with long white beards 
because assembling a new spell is not a quick and easy task, it usually takes time. And that's why for Clea when she does this, she realizes that it's high risk, because mixing magics together that usually don't go together, or that haven't been tested together, it could blow up in her face, or worse. But with her doing this, on one hand, I can't help but think that given the circumstance, her coming up with a solution on the spot, it's pretty convenient. But at the same time, a part of my mind is just able to let it slide because all she's doing is exercising these souls from this body, which is something that I'd imagine that any Sorcerer Supreme would be able to pull off. But given the circumstance that Clea doesn't really know who is behind this or what spells were precisely used to pull this off, that's the part that kind of gets me. Because in most cases, a Sorcerer would have to know what they're unbinding in order to unbind a spell. And again, even if they don't know the spell, the chances of them succeeding in unbinding said spell are way higher if they know who casted the spell to begin with. But again, I find that part of me is able to let it slide because she's faced a version of this before with Thunderstrike, who she had defeated alongside of the Harvestmen, who in addition did give her some information about what's going on here, but also because at its core, this new spell that she came up with, it was really just a more complex unbinding spell to remove this legion of ghosts from the physical body of Randall Spector. But with her pulling this off, she also hears a voice from a distance ask her, how did you do that? And it's here where we find that the Harvestman was not only impressed, but also intrigued on how Clea had pulled this off. Which from here leads to Clea telling the Harvestman that for one, he's late, but also she has a ton of more questions for him about these revenants as well as their connection to the Blasphemy Cartel, which is something that we'll get into on the next one which will also lead us into the reveal of getting the identity of who the Harvestman actually is. So with saying that, be careful in the comments if you haven't gotten that far just yet. All right, so in our last talk, we had seen the Blasphemy Cartel send their surprise attack on the Sanctum Sanctorum with the addition of the Shadow Knight Revenant. And obviously their intention was to catch Clea off guard and overwhelm her, but little did they know that her mother, Umar, the unrelenting, had planned dinner that night, which again, for the Blasphemy Cartel, it was just another example of them having the worst timing. Because had they attacked the Sanctum Sanctorum, back when Dr. Stephen Strange was around, he likely would have done a protection barrier spell and just wrapped these guys in the Crimson Bands of Sidorak and called it a day. But no, these guys want to come around when Umar's here. So as a result, she butchers them and drinks their blood. I'm like, man, every time it just keeps getting worse for these guys. But also like we'd seen just after Clea had taken care of the Shadow Knight Revenant, she's then met by the arrival of the Harvestman, who like we'd seen recently, he's Mistress Death's Sorcerer Supreme. But with them showing up here and Clea having already taken care of the Shadow Knight Revenant, we'll find that this has caused a bit of an issue between the Harvestman and Mistress Death, with Clea at this point having already done the Harvestman's job. But to be fair, there's no way the Harvestman could have beat Clea to it, because she was the one being attacked by the Revenant, so there's no way he could have gotten there sooner. But while we're on the topic of malicious attacks, I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you guys about this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Because now, more than ever before, we use the internet for everything. And there's a countless number of businesses and weirdos who are out there who just want to see what you're doing. But with a VPN service like Surfshark, you can have more privacy, security, and control instead of just going online unprotected and hoping for the best, leaving your financial information and personal files at the mercy of whoever's watching. So to avoid that, I've been using Surfshark for a while now, and I put it on everything because they allow you to use one subscription on an unlimited number of devices. So if I'm shopping on my phone or my iPad, or if I'm working or gaming on my PC, it gives me peace of mind knowing that I have total privacy and control. And with Surfshark giving me access to over 3200 servers in over 95 different countries, regardless of where I am, I have the freedom to access the entire internet and watch content that may be only available in select locations. So click the link in the description and use my code DOPE for 83% off and 3 extra months for free and get the most out of your internet experience with Surfshark VPN. But with the Harvestman arriving here, Clea asks him for more information on these revenants, and in response he lets her know that there's a rebellion in Death's domain. And for the most part, he explains once again how these rogue ghosts are banding together in the hundreds, and in some cases the thousands, and forming a gestalt entity united behind a particular hero or villain since their own identities had withered away over the ages. But with them lacking their individual identities, they have been able to come together and unite under a more simple concept or single identity that is easier for them to comprehend, which in these cases are heroes and villains, because they're seen more as symbols, which is what makes it easier for these rogue ghosts to come together and create this gestalt identity in place of their own individual identities. 
And like we'd seen before, this could play out differently, whether they unite under a hero or a villain. Because for example, we'd seen this happen on both ends, like on the hero side, when the group of these ghosts came together and reanimated Eric Masterson. Because when this happened, we were shown that they did inherit his power, to where then, in addition, they amplified it with there effectively being either hundreds or thousands of ghosts in this one body. Which, by the way, doesn't mean that he's a hundred or a thousand times more powerful, but with what we're shown, in different cases, there is a significant increase. But also with the example of Eric Masterson, because he was a hero, his attacks weren't as vicious as they could have been, with these ghosts uniting and modeling after someone who was originally good. And that's why, on the flip side, when it came to Shadow Knight, who was already crazy and a cold-blooded killer, that portion was then amplified when his body was reanimated and all of these rogue ghosts came together and united under that identity. So with those ghosts matching who Shadow Knight already was, that combination made his revenant more dangerous. But it's also here where the Harvestman tells Clea that someone's behind this and they're calling these ghosts from the dead. And with hearing this, Clea then asks, what's the connection between these revenants and the Blasphemy Cartel? But unfortunately, the Harvestman just doesn't have that answer. And he tells Clea directly that he doesn't know, but he'll definitely look into it because Mr. Death has charged him with ending the revenant threat. So for that reason, he's gonna do what he needs to do to see that through. And with them saying this, Clea points out that their goals align, since she wants to get rid of the Blasphemy Cartel. So it's for this reason that she offers to help the Harvestman with his duty of chasing down all these revenants in exchange for Dr. Stephen Strange. But immediately the Harvestman shoots this idea down, telling Clea to abandon this goal because Dr. Stephen Strange belongs to death. And he straight up tells her to just forget about him. And Clea tells the Harvestman that she was made to forget him once, and she's not gonna let that happen again. And like we'd seen before, this is another callback to Doctor Strange making a deal with Mephisto to save all of reality, which of course was a deal that came at the cost of Steven making Clea forget him, which was also referenced during the death of Doctor Strange event, with Steven's recent death causing all of Clea's memories to come rushing back, which also in a way is part of the reason why Clea is going so hard for Doctor Steven Strange, with the memories coming back and being fresh, as well as Steven's last words at the conclusion of Death of Doctor Strange when he admitted that he was a fool for a allowing that to happen, which at the time was a lot like him expressing that he should have found another way, instead of allowing Mephisto to pull them apart. So again, keep in mind for Clea, there's a strong undertone throughout this series that goes beyond her just wanting to get Steven back, because she's lost him a number of times consecutively, whether because of Mephisto or Mistress Death, and she's come to the point now where she doesn't want any outside forces determining their fate, and she's willing to do anything in her power to make sure that only her and Steven have a say-so in what happens concerning them. But with Clea telling the Harvestman that she refuses to forget Steven, he then tells her that the late Doctor Strange isn't worthy of such esteem, to where then he tells her to take his word for it and he just takes off. But as soon as the Harvestman leaves, Umar then gets ready to depart as well, but before she goes she tells Clea to think about what she said, as far as Clea using the title of Source of Supreme of Earth in order to take over the world, because with Clea being her daughter, this would be a win for Umar too. And Clea tells her in response, though she may be a warlord by blood, she's not a conqueror, but before Umar leaves she tells Clea, maybe not, or maybe not yet. And just before she goes, she tells Clea to just give it some thought. But after this, we then jump over to the next night, where we find that Clea has made her way to see Mr. Knight at the Midnight Mission. But with Clea coming here, she's come to get some expert advice from Mr. Knight, with him being someone who's died a lot and came back. So for that reason, she's come here in hopes of getting more information and hopefully finding a loophole that'll help her out. But of course, with her coming here, she lets him know that she recently kind of killed his brother. And in response, Mr. Knight's more or less like, oh, well in that case, I owe you one. But before they get too deep into this talk, he tells her that they gotta have this conversation on the move because tonight is a work night and Moon Knight has some business to take care of. But through the course of this Clea, she follows Moon Knight as he makes his rounds, drops by 8-Ball, roughs him up a little bit, which more or less is what he calls a check-in. But he also lets Clea know because he doesn't have magic powers, he has to scare them. And Clea's like, who? <laughs> Moon Knight's like, everyone. But through the course of this, he explains to Clea how his title works. Because when he dies, Khonshu brings him back to life for the purpose of doing his work. So when Moon Knight dies and constantly comes back, it's because Khonshu has more work for him to do. But this also causes Clea to be curious about how is it that Khonshu is allowed to take such liberties with death. And Moon Knight lets her know that it's because Khonshu's a god. And for gods, the currencies of life and death have always been pocket changed to them. 
But through the course of this, Moon Knight is chasing down some of Dr. Thaddeus Payne's men who's pretty much a guy who has a condition where he has to eat brains to stay alive and recently his men have been kidnapping a bunch of people so Moon Knight's beating on one of these guys to get him to talk and it's here Clea steps in to help and kind of speed things up so she then goes full fault teen on this guy letting him know that Moon Knight's just a man but her on the other hand she can show this dude the horrors of the dark dimension and right away this guy he then gets to talking but even with hearing this I couldn't help but think that you know Moon Knight he can do some scary stuff too you know and I'm sure Moon Knight's watching Clea like, psh, psh, nah, I could do that. I mean, I was just warming up to it. But from here, they then make their way to the location and they take down some more Dr. Thaddeus Payne's men, who he's also infected with his condition, which is kind of messed up. But with getting here, they find the hostages and they set him free. But in the case of Dr. Thaddeus Payne, rather than Clea or Moon Knight killing him, Clea then opts for the merciful slash worse than death solution, since that's kind of what these anti-heroes is on today. But what ends up happening is Clea ends up sending Dr. Thaddeus Payne to the Dark Dimension, where he'll have plenty of company with the mindless ones, which is kind of funny when you think about it. But from here, with the two of them effectively wrapping this up together, Clea thanks Moon Knight for his insight, but before she leaves, he tells her, for what it's worth, when we're talking about coming back from the dead, my experience is this, you need someone with the power and influence to do it, the kind of power and influence a god has, and even then, they're only going to do it so you'll work for them. And he goes on to tell her that Strange would be a good get for a god, or any other power with serious influence and pull, but who would be powerful enough to get a former Sorcerer Supreme to work for them? And it's right there where Clea says that there's only one she can think of. But after this, we then jump over to a graveyard where we follow the Harvestman and we find him having a conversation with Mistress Death to where she's more or less asking him for an update and expecting that things went well. But it's here where the Harvestman tells her that he had got there too late and the Sorcerer Supreme had claimed the Revenant. And really it's here where we see, like I'd mentioned before, that this would be a problem because in response, Mistress Death tells the Harvestman that the Sorcerer Supreme has overstepped her authority and she may require correction. And it's here where the Harvestman removes his mask and says no and that his wife shouldn't be punished for being who she is by nature. And of course, it's here we find out that the Harvestman has been Doctor Strange, who just like Clea, he's fighting for love and the hope of reunion. And he goes on to tell Mistress Death that she may have his very soul, but his heart remains with Clea. But yeah, like it's, it's pretty cool getting this reveal, but I kind of feel like all of us already knew this. And in a way, I'll admit that I was hoping that we got at least one more twist before we got Strange. But nope, the Harvestman, that's him. And either he has to work out his deal with Mistress Death, or Clea has to find the other god that's gonna bring him back. All right, so for this one, we begin with finding ourselves getting back into the mystery of the Blasphemy Cartel, who had initially came off as a magic-wielding terrorist group. And I mean, even still, I would say that's about right. But with everything that Clea has been looking into and also sharing with Wong, he can't help but to think that he should know more about this organization. But anytime that Clea has asked Wong about it or even shown him her latest findings, Wong finds himself having very vague recollections and really no memory of any detail that he could share that comes to be of any help. And through the course of this series, this has shown Wong that someone has blocked this information out of his memory. And from here, this is what takes us to following Wong, who at this point has left Clea in order to go out and find some answers. But also with doing this, he's accompanied by Bats, because Bats tells Wong that he never takes him anywhere. So this is Wong taking Bats everywhere. But for Wong at this time, as he leaves to go and find these answers, he makes his way to Chinatown, New York. But also while heading there, it's a quiet walk between him and Bats because Wong finds himself thinking about his name, which was his father's name and his father before him. And how from a child, Wong was told by his father that there is no greater failure for you than to outlive your Sorcerer Supreme. They are everything and you, we are nothing. And really, the reason why Wong is thinking about all of this, for starters, it's obvious because Dr. Stephen Strange is dead. But in addition to this, Wong finds himself out here looking for answers because he doesn't want the same fate to meet Clea Strange, who now is the current Sorcerer Supreme of Earth. So now he has to find these answers and let nothing get in his way. But while Wong is out, we find him making his way to the bar with no doors. And with doing so, he comes across flickering Jenny, who not only is the bartender here, but years ago she had been cursed by a witch who had caused Jenny to always have a constantly changing appearance, which as you could imagine, has made it hard for Jenny to get just a regular job out there. 
but it's here where we find that Wong has made his way to Flickering Jenny to ask her about the blasphemy cartel and any information that she may have heard, either directly or in passing, or if they've even tried to attack the bar with no doors. But Jenny quickly lets Wong know that an organization like that, they wouldn't dare try to attack the bar with no doors because they would be crazy to, with this place entertaining the likes of Agatha Harkness, Count Chaos, and the Scarlet Witch. So if anything, this is the last place that those guys would attack. So for Wong, after this, he then reaches out to Black Widow, who tells him to meet her alone. So Wong is then like, okay, sure. But then he's like, oh, I got bats with me. But Romanoff really doesn't mind, because lucky for Wong, she's a dog person. But with Wong asking Black Widow to meet with him, he reached out to her because Wong thinks that if no one else, Widow is the one person who knows everything about modern military and espionage operations. But unfortunately, from Wong's description, Widow's not able to identify who the Blasphemy Cartel is, but instead she's only really able to tell him who they're not, which of course isn't too helpful because this still has Wong looking for a needle in a haystack as far as identifying who these guys are and who's in their corner. But with him sharing with Widow what he does know, as far as the Blasphemy Cartel making moves for control in the occult underground, Widow lets him know that it makes sense. With these guys going after a group of people who are ungoverned or more or less undergoverned, that it makes sense that the Blasphemy Cartel is going to bring war to these competitive control areas. And since these people don't have a specific leader or government, of course they're going to look to the Sorcerer Supreme. But with Widow leaving, she more or less just lets Wong know that he's got to find where these people are. Because with the Sorcerer Supreme being thrown into this war, him and Clea are in a bad position with the Blasphemy Cartel knowing their address, while Wong and Clea no longer know any of theirs. But for Wong, after this conversation with Widow, he then finds himself being approached by the Lost Boys, who tell Wong that they don't appreciate him out here asking all these questions. And for that reason, they end up trying to jump Wong. But to their surprise, seven against one put them at a disadvantage. But also with these guys jumping Wong, he didn't bother to use any magic. But instead, he actually took this opportunity to blow off some steam. And really, one of the things for Wong is like, though he can fight, he doesn't want to go around just beating people up because he doesn't want the world to see him in that way. But if the situation calls for it, he's ready to defend himself. But at this point for Wong, after having his conversation with Widow, him and Bats then make their way to the X-Men's treehouse because Wong has reached out to Jean Grey to see if she would help him recover these lost memories. And in response, Jean told Wong that she'd help. And with Wong going to see Jean, she's glad to do whatever she can because in times past, Doctor Strange has helped the X-Men as well. So for Jean, she sees this opportunity to help Wong as the least she can do. And as she gets started, she lets Wong know that fighting spells of amnesia, they're not necessarily her area of expertise, but nonetheless, she's going to help and do as much as she can. And she warns Wong that this could be a bit uncomfortable. But from here, with Jean going into Wong's mind, she lets him know that she's not going to judge him for whatever she sees. And when Jean said that, for whatever reason, it made me chuckle while reading this issue. But with Jean going into Wong's mind, it made him think of his father, which we had seen Wong thinking about not too long ago, as far as Wong's father instilling in him the duties that he would have in servitude to the Sorcerer Supreme. But in addition to that, Jean sees a number of Wong's other memories, like him initially meeting Doctor Strange, as well as a younger Wong in training, and Jean lets Wong know that his memories are extremely turbulent. But nonetheless, she digs deeper in order to find what's being hidden which again for Wong is a very painful process. But nonetheless, he tells Jean to keep going because Wong sees even this grueling and painful moment or better yet the process of recovery in this moment and the pain that he's enduring to find these memories as a moment of him facing his demons, but also an opportunity for him to serve the Sorcerer Supreme. Because again, with him doing this, ultimately it's for the protection of Clea. But then it's here where we find that eventually Wong and Jean break through. The spell is broken and Wong's memory has returned. And he lets Jean know that regardless of how she feels, he's in her debt. And if the X-Men or Krakoa have anything that they need, all they need to do is just ask. But after this, Wong and Bats then make their way back to the bar with no doors. And when they get there, Wong approaches Flickering Jenny and he gives her a piece of Mysterium, of which he was given from Jean, that recently has become the new currency of the Sol system. But the special thing about Mysterium is that it's a unique metal with anti-magical properties. So when Wong gets back to the bar with no doors and he sees Jenny leaving, he gives her this coin calling it a tip. And when she catches it, he tells her what it is and he lets her know that it's enough to break the glamour of concealment. And right away, it's here where we find that this is actually Pandora Peters, the director of Wand. And right away, Wong demands that she tells him why he couldn't remember her or S.H.I.E.L.D.'s entire wizard, alchemy, necromancy department. And he wants to know why she's hiding at the bar with no doors, but also why is the Blasphemy Cartel using Wand equipment and tactics? And right away, when he says this, she knows that he hasn't figured it all out yet. 
because much like how after the Soviet Union had fell and the KGB became gangsters, the same thing happened with S.H.I.E.L.D. fell because the blasphemy cartel, they are wand and they want director Pandora Peters dead too. And man, it's crazy because as if S.W.O.R.D. and S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't have enough of a crazy history, now we find that wand has become the blasphemy cartel. All right, so as a bit of a brief recap, this series is the follow-up to the death of Doctor Strange, which we also covered and I have that link down below just below the like button. But since that conclusion heading into this series, we learned that he did a bit of secret sorcery to make Clea Strange, his wife, the next Sorcerer Supreme, which traditionally shouldn't have been possible. But much like we've seen before, Dr. Stephen Strange finds these loopholes, which is precisely how he made this happen. Cause when he died, he left a portion of his soul with Clea. But the reason why Stephen did this, it was to keep other nefarious characters from stepping into the title of Sorcerer Supreme. Like Dr. Doom, for example, who we saw in issue one pop up at the Sanctum Sanctorum, dropping all kinds of objections. Cause on the surface, Clea becoming the Sorcerer Supreme seemed like an illegitimate claim. But from the time that she became Sorcerer Supreme of Earth, cause she was already Sorcerer Supreme of the Dark Dimension. But from the time that she took over for the late Dr. Stephen Strange, her main focus has been to get her husband back. But finding that solution has been anything but straightforward with her running into the likes of the Blasphemy Cartel, who's like your magic based terrorist group, who initially seemed to have just come out of nowhere resurrecting dead superhumans like Shadow Knight and Thunderstrike for reasons that Clea hasn't been able to figure out yet. But as a result of these deceased heroes returning and it requiring an insane number of souls to do so, this caused Mistress Death to send forward her newly appointed Sorcerer Supreme, who we discovered in our last talk was actually the deceased Dr. Stephen Strange. Because after his death in the previous series, he struck a deal with Mistress Death where he agreed to get to the bottom of this in exchange for getting his life back. But at this point, with Clea just realizing that the Harvestman has been Steven this whole time, she doesn't get to ask him all the questions that she wants to ask him at first, because they're attacked by another Revenant. And this time around, it's the deceased William Foster, aka Goliath. And of course, Clea teams up with Steven to take the Revenant Goliath down. But the whole time through this fight, a number of things are going through her mind, because for starters, she thinks back on all the times that they fought together and how well they work together, as well as do other things together because over the years the two of them had just had a rhythm and even though it's been quite some time since she lost them in this moment they come together as if he had never left but rather quickly these thoughts and memories and emotions they bubble up to the surface for Clea so she takes Steven's scythe and she ends this because again it's been some time and there's a lot of questions that she needs answered but initially when she approaches Steven to hold him and tell him how much she misses him. Instead of embracing her, he tells her she has to stay back because the magic that she wields as Earth's Sorcerer Supreme and the power that he's been given by Mistress Death, they sit in opposition, like a negative and a positive, like matter and antimatter. So if they were to so much as touch, the results could be catastrophic. And he goes on to tell Clea that he didn't want to keep this from her, but the truth is he was afraid that he might fail his mission. So for that reason, he didn't want to get her hopes up. Cause again, his deal with death was if he succeeds, he can get his life back. And he wasn't exactly sure if he could pull it off. So Clea just tells him, let's go back home to the sanctum. Talk to Wong, we'll scheme, we'll plan, we'll figure it out. And also just as another reminder, earlier in this series, we saw Wong doing a bit of investigating on his own when he discovered that some of his memories were missing. So with Jean Grey's help to unblock a portion of it, along with a little bit of Mysterium, he was able to track down Pandora Peters, who at one point was director of Wand, Shield's wizardry, alchemy, necromancy department. And at the time he confronted her, asking her why is it that no one remembers Wand? And how is it that the Blasphemy Cartel is using Wand equipment? Which led to us getting the reveal that the Blasphemy Cartel is Wand. And we'll learn more about how Wand was taken down and how what was left of it became the Blasphemy Cartel as this series comes to a close. But right now, as Steven and Clea are making their way back to the Sanctum, we head over to the Blasphemy Cartel's main headquarters where we find Agent Nobody 84 reporting to the leader of the Blasphemy Cartel, Director Nunn. And all we're really told here before we go too deep into it is that their Lazarus project, which is what they've been using to bring forth and control these undead superheroes, is that it had an 87% chance at deterring the Harvestman before he can get close enough to find out what they were up to. But then Clea showed up and that number dropped exponentially because she's a wild card that they weren't ready for. But Director Nunn tells Agent 84 that he's not worried about her because there's a Trinity who he made a deal with and it wasn't the Vashanti 
who at this point he just refers to as the management. And in a very cryptic way, he just tells Agent 84 that magic has a price, so does spycraft. The first time I spoke to management, the things they showed me, if I had a sense of identity, it would have destroyed me. I had to pay a price for their patronage, for them to show me the way. I needed to become what I had to for the great work, which is really just him saying that he gave up his identity to get help from this group to make all of this possible. As they stand in front of this door that says Lazarus Project, Revenant Prime, which we'll learn more about as this story builds up and all the secrets unfold. Because right after this, when we go over to the Sanctum Sanctorum, we see Doctor Strange giving big hugs to Wong, Pandora, and he's petting bats. So of course, Klee is off to the side like, you know, would be nice if I could get a hug or something. But also keep in mind, like we talked about earlier, Wong just recently brought Pandora back to the Sanctum. So Clea really doesn't know who Pandora is. So right away, Clea tells Wong to tell her who this woman is because it's time to get down to business. Because right now they're at war. So there's not really much of any time for the pleasantries at the moment. So it's here where Pandora tells a story of how it went down two years ago back when she was director of WAND and things got out of hand at their prison site, which was codenamed Big Box. Cause at the time she reached out to Dr. Strange using this crystal ball that was like their direct emergency line so that Director Peters could reach out to Dr. Strange in the event that things got out of hand, which is precisely what's happening in this moment. And when Strange gets there, Director Peters starts breaking down the whole situation because recently one of her task groups, Bravo Charlie, they had been running a hypothetical scenario that was really more of a kind of war game that just went live 37 minutes ago, which made it no longer hypothetical. And she explains that it was like a Tibetan prayer wheel, which Doctor Strange is familiar with because it's like a drum filled with rolled up mantras. You turn the drum and it's almost like someone is saying the forbidden text out loud. But as it turns out, this scenario that was assigned to Bravo Charlie, it was digitally structured like a crypto mining network so that millions of these mantras could be executed through an algorithm in exchange for digital currency, which is wild. But you can tell while director Pandora is explaining this, Doctor Strange really doesn't know too much about cryptocurrency. And I mean, I'm not gonna act like I'm an expert, but I get the general idea of it because you're pretty much outsourcing other people's hardware, in most cases, GPUs. So these companies or whoever can process way more data by using other people's machines in exchange for digital currency, which just reminds me, man, I remember when Bitcoin was $100. And I wanna kick myself every time I say that. But again, with how this is done, it's like Strange is completely oblivious to anything crypto. So he's just kind of like, what? They're turning hundreds of computers into prayer wheels? And Pandora's just looking at him like hundreds. Like, nah, bro, that's a lot more than that. Because as it turns out, not only did this experiment accidentally go live, but also as we're told, this prison site, Big Box, it's a site for post-vital detainees, dead magicians, since many of them like to come back to life so often. But as a result of this experiment accidentally going live, every prisoner here has been possessed by screaming mad ghosts. But again, with this being like a prison for the dead, Wand would usually keep inmates on ice here at Big Box, but also when inmates would die at other prison sites, their bodies would get transferred here and it's those transfers who have been reanimated in this whole disaster. So at this point with Pandora filling in Strange, he tells her that he's going to activate Big Box's failsafe, which surprises Pandora because she didn't know that Strange even knew about that. But of course, because he's the Sorcerer Supreme at this time, he's been keeping an eye on the place. And though he doesn't fully understand all the ins and outs, he has been able to figure out some things. So Pandora leaves him another communication crystal. She wishes him luck and she lets the doctor work his magic. So what Strange ends up doing, since Wand uses a combination of the mystic arts combined with technology, since Strange isn't too savvy with the tech, he used the communication crystal to speak through it to the failsafe system while simultaneously communicating with its magic, which effectively had him walking in two worlds at the same time. But by way of doing this, him and the failsafe were able to come to an agreement so that it would activate and send the big box along with the number of its undead to the dark dimension where they could just sort out a number of their differences with the mindless ones. But after this, with Doctor Strange effectively solving the problem, Director Pandora goes on to explain that it wasn't until well after this when she realized what had truly happened. Cause even now with her explaining this whole story to Clea and the others, Pandora comes to this moment where she remembers introducing Doctor Strange to the head of Bravo Charlie. Because Task Force Bravo Charlie, BC Bravo Charlie stood for Blasphemy Cartel. Cause as it turns out, Director Nunn, who at this point in time was just an agent for WAND, 
Him and the members of his group intentionally activated that experiment. It wasn't an accident, but instead it was more like a test run for what the blasphemy cartel would later do on a much larger scale. But again, Pandora didn't realize what had happened until much later after Secret Empire, when S.H.I.E.L.D. fell apart, and WAND was shut down as well, because it was at this point where Director Nunn used an IMD, an incantation of mass distraction, <laughs> which is a hilarious title, I'm sorry. But this spell is what Director Nunn used to make everyone forget that WAND ever existed at the cost of his own identity, which is how he became Director No One. And the only reason that Pandora was able to still remember all of this is because she covered her tracks and laid low just after Secret Empire, back when the Blasphemy Cartel was still attempting to increase their numbers by recruiting more people from WAND and killing those who refused to follow their new leadership, which is what then sent Detective Peters on the run, and it's why she made her way to the Shroud of Bazaar, laying low as a bartender. And from here, this is where she goes on to tell Clea, this is where she stepped in the picture. Back when Clea arrived at the Shrouded Bazaar, which again, is like your pocket dimension in New York. That's kind of a safe space for magic users and mystical creatures with everything like fairies, orcs, trolls, Marvel's version of Gandalf, you name it. But nonetheless, with Clea coming here and claiming this place to be under her protection because it's technically in New York, this turned out to be something that the Blasphemy Cartel was not prepared for because Clea becoming the Sorcerer Supreme was something that no one expected. Because back when Pandora Peters was the director of WAND, she literally wrote the book on how to handle the Sorcerer Supreme just in case, or even potential others who may step into that title. And for that reason, WAND was prepared for others, like Mordo, Jericho Drum, Wanda Maximoff, and more, so that they would be ready for them. But as it turned out with Clea showing up, she's the wild card. So for them, that's one advantage. But on top of that, their next advantage is that Pandora Peters, the former director of WAND, though she doesn't remember Director Nunn's identity, she does remember the location of the Blasphemy Cartel's main headquarters. So that's where they're all gonna be heading next, to shut this whole thing down and give Dr. Stephen Strange his life back. All right, so coming back from our last talk, where we had Pandora Peters, the former director of WAND, break down the history of Director Nunn and the Blasphemy Cartel, which at the time, it only gave Wong, Clea, and Doctor Strange the answer to how the Blasphemy Cartel were able to get their hands on all these magical weapons, since they literally took it all from WAND, which was S.H.I.E.L.D.'s magical division, but a lot of other details remained a mystery, since Director Nunn wiped his identity from everyone's memory, which has continued to keep his identity a secret, but it doesn't change the fact that Pandora Peters, the former director want and the creator of the blasphemy cartel still knows where their base of operations is located so clea and the huntsman dr strange make their way there to shut down the blasphemy cartel once and for all now that all the pieces have come together and they can finally attack rather than just react and this now sets the stage for this fight to be the last one because after the blasphemy cartel is defeated mistress death's problem is solved and I mean, well, this problem at least, because according to the agreement with Mistress Death, as soon as this threat is eliminated, Dr. Stephen Strange can return to the land of the living. And as they arrive at the Blasphemy Cartel's headquarters, which is codenamed Emerald City, we find that it's set up as a flying castle in the middle of an artificial storm, which looks a lot like what Doom had going on towards the end of Thor Volume 6, when he was doing the mind control in the artificial afterlife, but this is something entirely different. Oddly similar when you think about it, but this is different. And when they get there, Strange makes sure to remind Clea not to kill the soldiers of the Blasphemy Cartel because they're all human. And he lets her know anything aside from that, revenants, demons, really anything else that's not human, have at it. So she begrudgingly agrees, even though it goes against who she is, but for as long as she's known Steven, that's who he's been. And that hasn't even changed now, with Mistress Death arming him with a scythe, making him the Harvestman, and giving him an overall task that you think would have went to some warrior or assassin, with Death assigning him to go after whoever was stealing these hundreds of millions and potentially billions of souls, because it causes Clea to think for a moment about how Steven could have used the abilities that Death gave him to kill these guys easily. But he hasn't, because he is, and always will be, a doctor first because a doctor believes that all can be saved and abhors the death of others, whoever they might be. 
because for Clea, with her being raised in the court of Dormammu, a place where cruelty was currency, sadism was strength, and viciousness was virtue. For Clea, in the beginning when she saw Strange go up against Dormammu and defeat him, and not even for the sake of despotism or dominance, but instead him just doing it to help others, it just reminds Clea that this is what caused her to fall in love with him so many years ago. So for Clea to see all these years later that that still hasn't changed, it just reminds her why she feels the way that she does about him, in spite of their differences. And just after this, we see one of the agents make their way to Director Nunn to inform him about the attack and ask for further orders, while mind you, it's recently come to Director Nunn's attention that the Harvestman is Doctor Strange, so he's still processing that curveball as well. But he just ends up snapping on the poor guy, and he tells him, you are all Bravo Charlie, the blasphemy cartel, get out there and blasphemy. No, I'm playing, he ain't say that. But he tells them more or less to get out there and do what they're here to do, to buy some time, because he's getting ready to fire up Revenant Prime. So for a moment, this guy's just kind of like, Revenant Prime ain't ready. So Director Nunn just snaps on him, because as it stands right now, he doesn't have much of a choice. And now that he knows that the Harvestman is actually Doctor Strange, who's fighting alongside of Clea, the new source of Supreme, Revenant Prime is the only asset they have that can stop them. And you can very much tell that's the case because they're just going through these demons necks like it's nothing while carrying on with their very casual conversation because it's also supposed to be here where the big reveal is given as far as how Doctor Strange made Clea the Sorcerer Supreme because they kind of go back and forth joking about the fact that Doom couldn't figure it out before since Doom is always and only focused on Doom. But the way that Doctor Strange was able to pull this off and do it legit was by giving Clea a portion of his soul which at this this point for Doctor Strange has become more or less his signature move, so I imagine sooner or later Doom would have figured it out. But nonetheless, this whole idea of Strange giving a piece of his soul to Clea to make her the Sorcerer Supreme while he was gone, it's brought up here to be like this big reveal. But I mentioned it quite some time ago, because to me it just felt like this story was trying to save too many things for the very, very end. And I ain't like that. But while Clea and Strange are having their moment, Director Nunn comes in on the PA, and he tells Doctor Strange how his death was the worst thing that could have happened to the Blasphemy Cartel, because they had everything planned to a T, as far as how they would continue with their plan and deal with Doctor Strange as the Sorcerer Supreme. But now that he's dead and come back as the Harvestman, alongside of Clea as the new Sorcerer Supreme, this gives Director Nunn two variables that he has to make adjustments for. And for us as the reader, this just shows us how Director Nunn really isn't the planning type, because all of these contingencies that he's talking about, they were created by Pandora Peters, the former director of WAND, so it's not like he's planned much of anything, even in the case of the Revenant program, which already existed, though on a smaller scale. So really all Director Nunn has been doing is just turning things up. Aside from that, he's just living up to his name. But it's also here where Clea asks Director Nunn, before she kills him, she needs to know, why? Why is he doing all this? What's the point of the Revenants? What does he intend to do with them? So of course, Doctor Strange reminds Clea, no killing, but in response to Clea, Director Nunn lets her know if they make it past his next wave, he'll tell her everything. To where from there, he releases all the Lazarus agents, who at this point are his last line of defense just before Revenant Prime. But among these four Revenants, these guys are really just beyond D-listers. Because for example, one of them is Frank Payne, aka the Constrictor. He was a former agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and he had like these adamantium whips or Constrictor coils that he could charge up for an attack. But even in his case, it's not like a one-to-one -one thing, because after Frank died, his suit was passed down to his son. So instead of the Revenant getting adamantium constrictor coils, they are just magic-based instead. But this time around, for both Clea and Doctor Strange, though these are the toughest opponents that they've faced since arriving here, she's able to cut loose a bit more, since Doctor Strange isn't concerned about these already dead Revenants dying again. So what they end up doing for most of these guys, it's the same method that they used on Shadow Knight a few issues back. So she just adapts it to each one of these guys so they can finish them off one by one. But after Strange kills the third Revenant, the fourth one impels him through the back with an attack that neither of them saw coming. But with how this is done, it's really just the gotcha moment because for one, Doctor Strange is already dead, and then number two, he really wasn't sure what to expect either. So by all means, this could have been the end of him again, which would then mean that he had failed Mistress Death by not fulfilling his end of the bargain. And speaking of fulfilling bargains, or more or less keeping one's word, it's here when the two of them approach Director Nunn, where he tells them all the little secrets that he's been keeping this whole series. 
because as it turns out, after Wand fell apart, he found new management by way of voices who whispered to him in the darkness, voices who happened to be some old friends of Doctor Strange. And these voices were the Trinity of Ashes. Which for Doctor Strange, this goes back to the War of Seven Spheres, when he was drafted by the Vishanti, who are quite literally his upper management, who demanded that he would face their rivals in a conflict that would last 5,000 years. So of course, initially he was reluctant to do so, but the Vishanti didn't give him much of a choice. And in the War of the Seven Spheres, he had a number of higher powers facing off against each other in this huge predestined cycle of conflict, and it already had been determined that the Vishanti and the Trinity of Ashes would be assigned as opposing roles. But back at the time, after Doctor Strange fought for the Vishanti and defeated the Trinity of Ashes, the Vishanti erased Strange's memories of those 5,000 years as part of the agreement with the Trinity at the end of the war. But the Trinity of Ashes, they remember everything. And this is why now the Trinity of Ashes is using the Blasphemy Cartel to get their revenge on Doctor Strange. And in addition to that, they wanted the Blasphemy Cartel to provide them with a body that would allow them to walk the earth. So Director Nunn provided the body of Robert Reynolds, the Sentry. But as it stands right now, Director Nunn promises both Clea and Doctor Strange that they'll be dead long before that happens. Because as it stands right now, what we're looking at is Revenant Prime. So much like the other Revenants we've seen that have had about a million souls wrapped up into one person, they've more or less done the same process with the Sentry, but with 100 million souls which now complicates this for both Clea and Doctor Strange exponentially. And right away to herself, not out loud, but just to herself, Clea admits that she's afraid. Because when the Sentry was alive, he was practically a god walking amongst the living. And now this undead version of him, who still displays much of that power, he's like a god amongst demons. And he's on demon time. And I'm not even gonna dress it up as far as this matchup, or even try to make it sound like this was a fight from here because Revenant Prime Sentry just walks the two of them and there's nothing that they throw at him that even phases him in the slightest. So just imagine what type of power this would eventually become when the process is complete and the Trinity of Ashes are placed inside of this body. Because at that point, we're talking Vashanti level dark magic. And that's not even considering what the Trinity would do with the Void. We're only looking at one side of the coin here. But as Revenant Prime Sentry is just smacking the two of these guys around, <laughs> literally, because again, there's no intellect going on here. It's just a hundred million insane souls wreaking havoc. Director Nunn is surprised and a bit afraid himself because he didn't even know that Revenant Prime Sentry would be this powerful, even at this stage. And aside from his sheer power, he is just moving too fast for either Strange or Clea to properly cast a spell. <laughs> so once again, it's, it's just not looking good for these guys. Because at this point, if Doctor Strange wasn't dead already, whoo! <laughs> this would have done it because it even gets to the point to where this remade body that death has given him it's not gonna hold up much longer because he's a few hits away from getting sent right back to her but before strange and clea are just completely finished director nun takes a moment to point out how the strange that lays here before him is nothing like the strange that the trinity of ashes spoke of the doctor strange that they were terrified of because of what he became during the war of seven spheres and for Strange, with him knowing that it's pretty much a wrap, he just looks at Clea and tells her to get out of there. But she doesn't leave, and instead she just crawls over to him, while telling him, live or die, we do it together. Alright, so coming back from our last talk, where we saw Clea and Strange infiltrate the Emerald City to stop the Blasphemy Cartel, this attack that started off really easy switched over to an impossible difficulty level as soon as Director Nunn unveiled the Revenant Prime, revealing it to be the Sentry possessed with 100 million ghosts, which according to Clea, this still has the Sentry at that god level power. And now I'm not quite sure if 100 million ghosts equates to 1 million exploding suns or what exactly is the transfer rate between the two, but really it's one of those things where we just gotta take her word for it, for what it is, because Clea's seen insane levels of power and she's aware of the level of power that Robert Reynolds was at when he was living, and she still acknowledges him here as an undead god who she's terrified of. But like we saw, this Revenant Prime Sentry easily defeated the Harvestman, Doctor Strange, as well as Clea, the Sorcerer Supreme twice over, with him being too powerful for them to combat and too fast for them to even do a spell on, which has now brought it to the point where Director Nunn is just gonna have the Sentry kill Doctor Strange and Clea so that he can hand over the Sentry's body to the Trinity of Ashes. 
But before this happens, Doctor Strange is telling Clea to get out of there, but she refuses to leave while moving closer to him and telling Doctor Strange, live or die, we do it together as she moves in to touch him one last time before they both get bodied. But I want you guys to keep in mind that prior to this, it had been established that when Doctor Strange made a deal with death and became the Harvestman, he embodied a power that was the antithesis of magic, with magic being life and the Harvestman belonging to death. So the whole idea was if they were to touch, the results would be catastrophic. And that's why since Doctor Strange removed his mask and revealed himself to Clea, they've had to keep their distance because if they were to make contact, it could be like antimatter colliding with matter, where both particles destroy each other and more. But with how things have played out in this fight, the way that Clea sees it, it's like, look, we're about to be killed anyway. And if that's the case, they should be able to go out on their own terms. And she tells him, if this act is to be our last, let it be one of love. Let it be one of defiance. Let it be one of catastrophe. And as she goes in to kiss him, Director Nunn is just yelling, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. But what ends up happening, it's much like what Doctor Strange had described before, with life and death coming into contact, exploding and imploding at the same time raw metaphysical energy burning and freezing all at once and it's enough to wipe the emerald city from existence and everyone in it including them but as we're told clea is not doing this as haphazardly as it would seem because since steven died she spent time mastering opposing forces with her being the sorcerer supreme of earth as well as the dark dimension and as we're told it's this experience that's given her the idea of using the same thing that Steven gave her to make her the Sorcerer Supreme after his death, which as we learned was a piece of his soul that he attached to her before he died. So Clea uses that piece of Steven to bridge their two souls together and harness this insane raw metaphysical energy that is being emitted between the two of them, which is super fascinating. Because I was looking at an article from University College London that was talking about how when matter and antimatter collide, depending on the colliding particles, not only is there a great energy release, but new different particles may also be produced. And I say it's fascinating because that's pretty much what we get here. And full disclaimer, I'm no expert when it comes to antimatter. I'm no Adam Brashear, okay? <laughs> but I do appreciate when any fictional story takes pieces of actual science, whether they be practice or theories, and implement it in the way where it's just enough to make it make sense. Because once again, not an expert, but the article did say when these two objects collide, with one being matter, one being antimatter, in the case that it did produce something new, that new thing would be smaller in mass, which is definitely not the case here. But like I said, I don't need it to be perfect, just make it make sense, even if it's just a little bit, and I appreciate that we get that here. But nonetheless, at this point with Clea and Doctor Strange merging together, they become a cosmic entity that very much reminds me of the Living Tribunal, though instead of having three faces representing equity, necessity, and vengeance, where at one point vengeance was represented by death, so there's that. But in this case, you have the scythe instead of the staff in only two aspects, life and death, which in this case, I guess would make them the Living Bibunal, <laughs> the Big and Back Bibunal. But also just to add a bit more here, by way of bonus content for the big spill slash full story, I wanted to point out that initially, when we covered issue 10, a few of you guys were really digging the look of Cosmic Entity Strange and also comparing it to Eternity, which I totally understand from a visual aspect because anytime someone gets a cosmic upgrade, that's usually the visual that Marvel goes for. But if we're talking more about the look, then I'd have to say that I believe that they were going for the look that Doctor Strange took on back in Doctor Strange issue 177, when Asmodeus sent Clea to a hostile dimension and Doctor Strange risked everything to go after her, which got him stuck there too. And at the time, the main reason why Doctor Strange couldn't come back was because Asmodeus stole his appearance and it prohibited Doctor Strange from coming back. So to come back, he changed up his appearance too, with them saying at the time that he has a lot more than just one. So again, to me, if we're just talking about the look of what we're getting now with the cosmic entity Strange, to me, it seems more like they were trying to bring some of this back as a bit of a deep cut reference while mixing this look with Clea and the cosmic powers they both now have access to, which again, Marvel usually does by throwing stars into the character's design. And to be honest, I don't blame them for doing it because more often than not, it comes out just looking really sick. But when director Nunn asked what they are, they both respond saying strange. And just to be clear here, aside from the merging of these two powers, we're not given a full scale description of how powerful this strange is. And I doubt that it reaches the level of the living tribunal. 
but just based on what we are given within the context, this strange entity is considered to be an equal as far as the brute strength and power that's being wielded by this version of the century. And I want to be sure to make it clear that we're dealing with a lot of bespoke elements here. And I say that because I know there's some of you guys who just like to take videos like this or read issues like this and say, oh, the Sentry is as powerful as XYZ and he was one to one with the strange entity. And that means like, nah, nah, I'll tell you what that means. Nothing. Because there's too many wild cards at play here, in this story at least, to take anything from this and jam it into some who's as powerful as what kind of story and potentially get into an argument on Reddit where someone else is going to tell you what I'm telling you now. So with that said, just take it for what it is in this story, nothing more. But at this time, a director Nun telling the sentry to attack the strange entity. They're at a stalemate, neither one is overpowering the other. So right here, the cosmic entity strange looks into the sentry's eyes and they tell him, you deserve better than this, Bob Reynolds. You are more than a vessel. And right away, they break free the 100 million ghosts trapped inside of the sentry, which then causes him to go unstable. And it creates the scenario where now the sentry is a ticking time bomb that's getting ready to explode and destroy everything in a one mile radius, which on one hand isn't that bad since the Emerald City is isolated within this artificial storm, so really only the people here would be killed, which is fine with Clea, but inside of the strange entity, you have both Dr. Stephen Strange as well as Clea Strange going back and forth because Stephen would rather spare the lives of the blasphemy cartel agents instead of just leaving them here to die. And eventually Clea, she reluctantly agrees. Because another thing that's pretty much unique to this situation is that both Steven and Clea, though they can speak individually, in this moment they've got to be on the same page to pull this off. And the crazy thing is, what they end up doing here, which takes them little to no effort, it reaches far beyond the abilities of either the Sorcerer Supreme or the Harvestman. And it's even something that Doctor Strange wouldn't have been able to pull off as Sorcerer Supreme without hours of preparation or endless deals with higher powers or the consumption of magical artifacts because what they end up doing is seeking out every soul across emerald city every agent of the blasphemy cartel and they send them all back to their regular lives but without any memory of being blasphemy cartel agents which on the surface sounds like a simple act but it's really op when you think about it for them to figure out who all these people are and where they're from and send each and every one of them back that fast it's pretty wild but also with doing this we quickly find out that the strange entity isn't exactly omniscient because just after saving all the other agents, they tell Director Nunn that they are not able to do the same for him. And it's mainly because of the deal that he made with the Trinity of Ashes, who erased his identity so that he could become Director Nunn and deliver the Sentry's body to them. And it's kind of sad because at first he's like, you know, I don't need you to save me. And then he starts crying out to the Trinity of Ashes like, come get me, save me. And it just creates one of those cases where, you know, with Strange effectively stopping the Blasphemy Cartel, he's fulfilled his end of the bargain with death. So him and Clea convert back to two individuals individuals and they make their way back down to the ground while Director Nunn is left behind with the destruction of the Emerald City. Where in his case with Director Nunn it's one of those things where that could mean anything. But also with Doctor Strange and Clea coming back it's here where death lets Steven know that a deal is a deal. The revenant threat is ended and Steven's time as the Harvestman is complete. So she restores him back in the land of the living. And I'm not sure why but it's kind of funny to me when death departs because the last thing she says is until we meet again. Cause I'm just like, oh, you didn't have to say that. But effectively, this gives us the return of Doctor Strange and the conclusion of this story, which will definitely have a number of repercussions that follow these events that have taken place, especially in the case of Death herself. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here, who wants more information, how to support the channel i got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill but that'll do it for this one guys let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and we'll do it again on the next one all right later